Okay, good afternoon and welcome everybody. I'm Howard Coe from the Division of Public Health Practice. It's great to see you all and welcome you to our eighth and final presentation in our Public Health Practice Leadership Speaker Series. We've had an absolutely fantastic year where we've featured nationally known and internationally known speakers to talk about the topic of public health leadership. It's been an absolutely uh, tremendous year for all of us. So I want to thank all of you for your support. Uh, as always, I want to thank our wonderful, wonderful Student Advisory Committee. This, this committee has done a, an incredible job organizing this series. And special thanks, of course, to our wonderful colleague, Betty Johnson, who has been the quarterback of all this from, from beginning to end. Uh, today, I am really very excited and honored and pleased to be sharing the podium with a wonderful colleague and friend, Professor Bob London, who you will all see in action in just a second. For those of you who do not know Bob, he is one of the most learned, brilliant, and informed speakers that we have and professors that we have at this school. And every presentation that he has is, is something that we all look forward to and learn from and regard as a, as a treasure in terms of our public health education. So we're very, very grateful to have Professor Blunden here today. And introducing him will be one of our stalwart members of our student advisory committee, Cecilia Gerard. So a round of applause for Cecilia. And former students. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Cecilia Gerard. I'm here on behalf of the Student Advisory Committee to the Division of Public Health Practice. Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. But before I do, a quick announcement. Howard and Betty asked uh, me to take time now to invite you all to an event that the division is having. It's the annual open house. Um, it's taking place Friday, May 16th from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. at the landmark. I'm sorry? May 14th. Excuse me. So then it's a Wednesday. Okay, Wednesday, May 14th from uh, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. at the Landmark Center. The open house is our opportunity to interact with community leaders in the Boston area and public health practitioners. It was designed with students in mind, so we hope you uh, will make make that event. Uh, so now, uh, about Dr. Robert Blunden. Dr. Blunden is Professor of Health Policy and Political Analysis here at the School of Public Health and at the Harvard Kennedy School. He's received outstanding teaching awards from both schools. Um, he also directs the Harvard Opinion Research Program and co-directs the Washington Post and Kaiser Family Foundation survey project, which was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Dr. Blunden is a member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences and the Council of Foreign Relations. After 9-11, he began exploring public opinion and emergency response to crises. As graduate students thinking about our futures in public health, uh, we're interested to know what course of action a leader can take when a crisis arises that generates a public health priority. To speak to you on this topic, what leaders need to know in a public health crisis, please welcome Dr. Robert Blunden. Hi, most importantly, if you're in politics, can you hear me on the back row? <laughs> the, um, uh, 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 quickly, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm gonna be informal, I'm gonna try to give you some insights uh, that would be a little bit different than just the regular uh, talk. Uh, but one of the things I, I focus a lot on is, is crises. So I want to be sure that all of us acknowledge what's going on in Southeast Asia. And within 48 hours, the system either works or not, or a lot more people are going to lose their lives. So, uh, And it's 48 hours that everything has to start to roll uh, or, or, or not. The uh, uh, Let me sort of. Uh, most of you and you will continue to know me in the field of politics uh, and policy, yet that's not really what I'm going to talk about uh, today. So let me just explain a, a little bit. First, uh, as a result of my interest in this area, I've come to play this very odd role at two schools at, at Harvard. So uh, everybody introduces themselves. This is the decade at Harvard of leadership. You cannot be at any single spot and not be a leader. 
And uh, my role is I'm the professor of followership. And so what's very important is uh, in, when people like to talk about great presidential leaders, they go back to Franklin Roosevelt, but they really ever quote a particular thing he said, which was his advisors asked him to do something very, very significant. And he turned to them and he said, you know, it's very hard to be a great leader if nobody follows you. Uh, and so what I focus on is actually uh, uh, how average people think about the issues. Uh, and what happened is, so uh, for many of you, uh, it, it's important to know that careers do not take planned directions. And so uh, uh, after 9-11 uh, and then with the anthrax outbreaks in the United States, what happened was, those of you familiar, the performance of CDC in the public arena uh, was extraordinarily low. It's the, uh, the, we'll talk about in a second, the top senior leadership only were asked to resign. It was terrible. So what happened was, uh, one of the things that they were not at all aware of is actually what was actually happening with average people in, in the cities that were there. So the uh, chair of the CDC advisory committee uh, Steve Schroeder, who was also president of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, supported our work, which dealt with public attitudes to all types of things. He gave us to the CDC uh, in the middle of this crisis. And with a statement, Blendon, you probably can do something to help these people. And so what we're going to talk about is how, how that evolves. And so for those of you who are not familiar, I essentially own a technology that we have brought into this field that's widely used. So today, the technology I use is being used all over Indiana uh, and, and North Carolina. There's nothing unique. But in public health, it's as if we opened up a new laboratory. What is that? The use of short-term polls to find out how people who are directly directly threatened by crises, see it, think about it, uh, and reacting, and then try to think from the leadership point of view how you might uh, re respond to this, uh, for this. And I, I, I need to make two points, and Howard's here uh, and is a longtime uh, veteran of this. The, uh, the big crises that affect people's lives have disproportionate impact. And in our world, many people don't pay enough attention to how big an impact. And there are two reasons, and let me explain why. For citizens and countries uh, and the press, they judge the competency of their governments by how you deal in these very crucial Katrina-like uh, moments. Now, over the average of all events, it shouldn't matter. But it does. It turns out that citizens across the world determine if their governments are, are, are effective. Uh, secondly, uh, these very big public health crises, or it could be huge hurricanes or cyclones uh, or bombings, depending on uh, uh, what, what this uh, issue is, has a huge impact economically. And uh, for most of you who've taken courses, we do these projections of how the patterns of disease affect health 32 years, 42 years. Uh, and, but it turns out in a crisis, the economy is instantly affected. So uh, let me see if I can describe Toronto with SARS. At the end of the day, there were 250 cases. It cost the Ontario province in lost income $4 billion. Uh, Air Canada went bankrupt. Uh, uh, they almost lost their complete uh, uh, summer vacation travel. As a result, the government removed every senior person uh, who was in charge of that, uh, uh, for that. Now, uh, uh, obesity grew in Toronto, heart disease may have grown in Toronto. Nobody removed anybody from office. Uh, more people are eating sugar and candy. The health commissioner doesn't go. A failure like SARS uh, and so, uh, is so powerful because the citizenry make a judgment of this. In China, not only were the senior leadership removed, many of them actually went to jail. Uh, after Katrina, uh, almost everyone in state and local government were, were removed from office, right or wrong. They might have done this. In the CDC case, it was anthrax, uh, which was something that had not occurred uh, frequently. It's not clear who was ultimately responsible for the managing, but those of you familiar know the whole top leadership uh, disappeared at the end of this. So how you handle this as a leader has way disproportionate impact uh, uh, for this. 
So what have we been about? We have used this technology uh, to both go in the city. So let's go down the list. When the anthrax attacks were going, we were interviewing simultaneously in the cities. Uh, when SARS was going on, we were interviewing right in Toronto and across Canada and the American response to it. Not months, not years. The, the days. Uh, in Katrina, we had a team of 40 interviewers with the Washington Post and Kaiser interviewing the people who did not leave the city within five days uh, 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 of the storm hitting. When we had this, the uh, uh, vaccine shortage of flu, we were interviewing all over the country of how people actually respond uh, to a vaccine shortage. And if you get any questions, I'm going to talk about because people more ethereally described how that worked out. And on the ground level, if you actually talk to people, you would have had, had a very different uh, uh, level. Uh, when, uh, because uh, uh, the Vice President of the United States was convinced that Iraq had smallpox, you may remember uh, the issue of this, and we uh, quickly got in there to find out how Americans felt about smallpox, and I'll show you some of the results uh, about uh, about that, uh, but one of the takeaways from all the work that we've had is, and this I usually reserve for what I call post-leadership sessions. You got the job you always wanted. Now you secretly know the fact that a large share of the public will not go along with you in a crisis. And then we close the door and we have conversations. So I'm going to have these conversations. So let me give you the classic examples in, in, in this crisis field. Uh, Surat India, uh, those of you familiar, have a, um, a, an outbreak of bubonic plague. The authorities assure everybody in the town they have enough antibiotics, they can quarantine people. This is quite controllable. Uh, within two weeks, one third of the whole town flees. Uh, regardless of what the public health authorities say. And in the one-third are all the doctors and pharmacists. So what you have is a complete lack of, yeah, I almost believe you that you can do this, uh, gone. And for this, and they were completely unaware that this was happening. Three Mile Island, uh, where the public health authorities uh, and the other authorities said to people, because was, it's a very narrow road to get out of there, that it's completely safe, nothing's going to happen. It, only mothers with pregnant uh, women need go. Uh, 30 percent of the people people left within 48 hours, including a third of the doctors and nurses. Uh, so in Katrina, they ordered everybody out, and 20% of people chose to stay. And we went in and talked to them about why they did and what you'd have to know. But the important thing you secretly know is that because we have a set of guidelines, in an emergency does not mean people will follow you. You can be more or less effective at this, and that's what we've been trying to understand. But it is a big mistake to think that because I have this. And so that's what we're sort of going to deal with uh, here, and then we'll have plenty of time for um, uh, crises. Uh, also, uh, th the one I had, uh, you know, fun because it was a case of one, and it was so uh, much an example of U.S. individualistic behavior, uh, and that is uh, one person uh, with a, uh, a rare form of TB uh, that, in fact, uh, may not be easily treatable, goes off to Europe to get married, uh, everybody gets concerned, orders this one person to not come back on a public plane. He, of course, has a four-second thought and says, I don't trust these authorities. And, of course, sneaks through another country, comes back, and goes on the Today Show, accusing the CDC of complete irresponsibility, with the interviewer going, tell me more. Tell me more. <laughs> Tell me more. Uh, so, uh, and so, uh, I know I wish I had a set of guidelines and I could have read it to him about how he should behave, but this is not uncommon of what we would face if we had a, a major outbreak. So, uh, for those of you who are from research backgrounds, there are actually two fields that our work overlap, and as so much uh, as many of you work in different fields know, these two fields rarely communicate with each other. So one field is called risk analysis, uh, uh, of which maybe the people, but the other is a whole research field which has to do with emergency and disaster policy. And the difference between risk is they go in after a bombing, after a hurricane, after uh, an explosion, after any cyclone, earthquake, and they interview the people and they interview government officials and they try to find out what they actually thought was going to happen versus what, what actually happened. And they draw a set of conclusions. Sometimes they correspond to the risk people and actually sometimes they have a, a, a very different view. So I draw from that, but I also draw from our uh, own work. So 
I'm not going to uh, give you, you know, the results of 10 sides. I'm just going to take a few principles to show what can help in understanding. So the first is, and my apologies to people, but we've now done a lot of work on this. And it's a very simple fact. Uh, the public does not respond to threats when they're not threatened. Uh, and so uh, it turns out, I'll show you data, millions of dollars are spent preparing people for everything from pandemic flu to sarin gas attacks uh, to another bioterrorist attack. And it has almost zero impact on the willingness of people to take any precautions or think at all. Now, that's different. So my colleagues in the prevention world get very, very upset. So let me separate this out. If you are trying to alter people's behavior to something they see in a day-to-day -day basis, heart disease, Alzheimer's, stroke, cancer, smoking, obesity, over time, we can alter behavior. If I'm asking them in a busy life to prepare for a threat they've never experienced, it gets about four seconds of their attention. And so the, what happens is we actually are spending millions now to prepare people for threats that they will not listen to. So uh, we'll get into this in the discussion a little bit later. But uh, Professor Blenheim's bottom line is take the money and do it on the preparation of reducing the time that you can have first class information available if a crisis starts. So let me just give you a quick example, then, then I'll go on. The, the Israelis that uh, have a country under continuing threat from riot sources do not spend their life educating people. Today is sarin gas week. Tomorrow is bioterrorism and small talks week. Now we're going to talk about a dirty bomb. And you wash yourself there and you do that. Not at all. What they've done is prepare a series of first class education films that would go on the minute something happens. And so, to avoid the fact in a 24-hour news cycle, many of the people on cable don't have a clue of what people should do. But if it happens in the evening, they're going to be on saying, well, anthrax is like shampoo. You know, it sort of sticks to you. Uh, and then you're going to be on the next morning trying to explain, actually, anthrax doesn't like shampoo. It doesn't stick to you. That's not the way it's transmitted. So uh, they have a series of uh, 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 films, uh, by the way, in working with people who dealt with these, the first thing you learn as a public health leader is you don't control the media. They're on 24 hours a day. And they run things that may or may not be accurate. Uh, and if you're not able to staff it and really relate to this, they'll run what's available. But anyhow, one of the things you can do is basically reduce the time of getting high quality information. Also, wire things up. Now, does that mean that people pay no attention to anything? Yes, they do if it arrives in a country near you. So when SARS is in Toronto, Americans were actually thinking about taking preparations. But when SARS was in Hong Kong, they were not. So to spend millions of dollars to have you prepare for SARS in Hong Kong, you have a, 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 a and I'll show you the data, uh, of a very, very low uh, response. So what you want to do is invest in the speed that you can get high quality information to people about what to do with the threat as it's emerging, but not worry about a lot of uh, uh, pre-education. The second point is, uh, and then we're going to do this in, in uh, uh, two forms, uh, people actually act uh, on information or knowledge they have, even if it's incorrect. Now, this is one of the public health fallacies because we are a science-based group. We believe when we say we're not sure what the agent is, that people actually are waiting for our result. It turns out that people reason from historic experiences with diseases or illnesses or, or what was done, and they put it in their head. I call it a chip in the head, and they start behaving based on other things they believe. So it turns out that there was a study done of uh, people who actually survived, and most don't, who in the course of big fires hid in closets. And so when they finally found those alive, they interviewed them, why would you hide in a closet? Because their parents taught them that that was the safest thing to do. Uh, in the San Francisco fire, it turns out that thousands died who ran into the fire. Now, it was not uh, that they were being irrational, they actually thought that the wind was blowing in the opposite direction. We had no way to tell them. So people have these pieces of information, I'll show you examples, which are often wrong, but they will act because you're not answering the question, which way should I run?
You're not answering the question. Be sure you don't tell your children to hide in, in closets during fires. You're over up here explaining some uh, scientific finding, and it's not what people think. They have things from their experience uh, that they build in. Uh, if people feel threatened, they generally act rationally to protect themselves and their families uh, based on their perceptions of the situation. And I'm going to get in a lot of trouble with you. With people in leadership positions, they walk around, they bite their nails, and we have a discussion. Uh, what, do I, what do we find? What we find is that there are very few human beings who talk about what is best for the population. And in a crisis, they actually behave on what is best for themselves and their families. And to the degree that you can make your recommendations sound like uh, 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 that uh, it actually is not only good for something larger, it actually is good for families. And I'll give you a couple examples. But there's enough gray hair here and movie buffs to remember there were two Titanics. In Titanic 1, uh, the people were what I call terribly British. You stood up and you lined up and you said, I am at a lower risk. He is a child is at a higher risk. You get on the boat. And we all stood up. Everybody took a number. I know I'm too old. I will die. And <laughs> ah, ah, the poorest mother, she must be on the boat. We have to do that. And the band played on. In the Titanic 2, which turns out historically to be quite correct, the rich actually locked people downstairs. Older people climbed over children. Uh, uh, for this, crew threw other people over, uh, overboard. The idea that you would be signed a risk score and volunteer to die, uh, it just turns out not to, not to be correct. Uh, and so uh, you have to th think your advice. And let me just give you an example. Uh, from Canon SARS. So people are getting off a plane. They're coming from international flights. They're coming from Asia. They could have been transmitting these things. Uh, I would like to keep them in some sort of isolation or quarantine for a bit. I can do two things. I can say to them, we would like to restrain uh, you here for the health of Toronto. Good, so I could say. Or the blending option is, you know, if you got the disease, we have specialized people that would be right here with you. And we're concerned that you could infect your family. So we'd love you to stay with us in isolation because if anything happens, we have a team right here that could really help you out, you know, and also we're really worried about you and your family. Now, the net result uh, is the same, but people are saying, gee, I don't want to infect my family. Uh, and you're actually saying oh, you're going to do something uh, for me. Now, this issue, and I just want to alert you, takes on huge importance when it comes to first responders. So it, it turns out, and we've been involved with special programs with the fire people who were involved with 9-11. And so I'll say, say this because we have enough time and I don't think that they'll mind. Uh, a number of the senior people said if the planes went down in Queens, many of the fire people would never have shown up. They would not have shown up because not that they would risk their own lives, they would not risk their family lives. So uh, it turns out that frontline responders, doctors, nurses, and SARS, uh, firemen, and police will risk their lives but not their families. Give me an example of where that didn't work out. New Orleans. Turns out uh, they had no communication system where uh, you could communicate with police fire or you could communicate back to your family. Everything collapsed. As a result, a very large number of police, fire, and public health people abandoned their roles. And so, uh, before we look at why, you know, and terrible, what you have to understand is they didn't know if their families were protected. So, could I do something about that? Yes. Every agency should have a family protection team. Uh, which, uh, in the course of an outbreak, you know will go and take care of your family. You'll get them out uh, of town. You'll take them to shelter. You'll take them to safety. If there's an infection, I guarantee you'll be at risk, but we have some protection so your family will not be exposed uh, to what it is. But it turns out even first responders will not risk the lives uh, 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 of their families. And so if I'm sitting there firing out directions, I'm going to discover they're not going to go if I haven't protected their families.
because my chip is population health. What is the best to do for everybody? The chip of most people interviewed is, in fact, uh, I have to protect my family. So whatever you say, and so if I have to do things where some families are at risk, I want to make it as non-threatening, not specific, uh, anything so I don't say to people that you are expendable, your children are expendable, your part of town is expendable. Uh, the, the fourth, and these are uh, just sort of provocative things to get uh, people discussing. The fourth is what's happened in this country and other countries, and many of uh, you may do this, we've combined agencies into, after 9-11, into these super agencies that deal with securities and threats. Every city has, has one of these. And the first thing you learn in skill building is when you get together with people you don't know, you say you all share the same beliefs, values, and problems. So there's a sort of holding around the hand, I'm police, I'm from fire, I'm from Homeland Security, I'm from public health. We all have the same problems. Turns out from a public perception, deadly wrong. So let me just give you a couple of examples. In a bombing, uh, the uh, two problems you have is, first is people rush back in the look. There is a gawking factor. So you're trying to bring in all these trucks and relief workers, and thousands of people actually wanted to stand, gawk, or help uh, around the 9-11 building. So keeping people out, getting them out and not coming back is a big problem. Second problem is the psychological problems are intense the first 48 hours and dissipate over time. Now, let me take you back to smallpox. Uh, uh, smallpox, in the history of the world, no crowd ran back in the city to stand with the smallpox people. Uh, really, that's not how people behave. What is your problem with smallpox? They flee. And we don't want them to flee. So in a bombing, I don't want you to come back in town. In smallpox, I don't want you to leave town. So, uh, secondly, and then the psychological issues in epidemics are completely different. The first few cases, the people we survey are oblivious. Hmm, there's a new case of SARS. Yeah, I read about it. Uh, three weeks later, uh, they're packing up the old van. They can't sleep at night. They're wearing garlic around their neck because somebody on the internet told them, you know, uh, uh, this to do this. So, uh, epidemics have a very slow fuse, and your fear is leaving house area. Uh, bombings have coming in and the immediate psychological impact on people who've had such a terrible, threatening thing. So you really have to think in both how you would deal with that uh, somewhat different. So we were asked to evaluate. Uh, this actually had a very important government name, but it later got called the duct tape. Uh, effort. You will uh, remember this. Uh, Homeland Security spent millions of dollars to have people learn and try out sheltering in place uh, 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 for that. And so, um, and I'm going to teach you a, a little bit about statistics in a second uh, about. Uh, about the problems of that in a crisis. But anyhow, after the millions were spent uh, for a problem, so what did Professor Blendon know? Professor Blendon knew that the concern about a terrorist attack, which had been high in 9-11, went down like that. You know, as the time goes, there's not another event. It starts, slips from people's memories. They don't do that. So this was, if there were months of alerts, up and down, be fair, do that, look at the suitcase, don't do that, don't worry. And people just stop paying attention. So they spent millions for you to shelter. So what did the results say? After the millions were spent, we went in right afterwards, 12% of people had some evacuation plan. The largest part of that was how to leave your own house. Uh, you may think millions of dollars to learn how to leave your house is a very important uh, achievement. Uh, a few uh, actually thought about leaving their community. A few thought about where they would go. 4% practiced. But actually, for millions of dollars, that is a very low r return rate uh, for that. And wh why was it so low? And you could see first finding. I'm not that worried about another terrorist attack. I'm not going to sit around here listening to campaigns tell me about something I'm not that worried about. So the answer is if they're worried, they, they, they do things and they're not. And that doesn't mean everybody does it. So uh, this is Toronto right in the middle of uh, SARS. 
the, uh, so the blue bars, hey, I'm worried. The yellow bars are, I'm not worried. Uh, so uh, here's compliance. In the middle of uh, SARS, uh, the health department said that there was no reason for you to have a face mask. It would do no help for you. Uh, one out of five worried people said to hell with you went out and bought them. So they completely cleaned them out uh, 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 for that. Uh, and so here you see also what happens is uh, uh, people uh, have decided they're going to avoid people visiting Asia. Well, how would I exactly know running, seeing somebody on the street if you had visited Asia recently? Well, what do I do? I avoid anybody that looks like they had ever one hour had anything to do with Asia. <laughs> So to no surprise, all sections of Toronto uh, were, were empty. And of course, some of the authorities were saying, be sure to avoid people who look like they've come in from the plane. Well, how would I know? So I avoid everybody that, that, that looks at. So uh, there's some lessons about how you describe uh, what it is to do. But the concern levels really uh, go. Uh, let me deal quickly with the issue of a, a chip. This is one, one of my favorite. So this is four and a half years after AIDS was discovered. The question was asked, uh, is, is it contagious like a cold? And of course, anybody in the scientific community would get a D if you said yes. But four and a half years later, a third of the public did believe it was spread just like that. Why do I care? I care because at the same time, an issue emerged, which was children showed up in school with AIDS and parents were emptying out the schools. So I have two quick lessons uh, uh, for you, because I did this actually with one of the science editors uh, of the New York Times. So the New York Times is uh, actually, it was in New York that had some of the most visible cases, there were other places, uh, ran a story which said the National Academy of Sciences said that it's perfectly safe for your child uh, to go to school. For us, what else could you want? It's the blue chip. It's the, yeah, what else could I say? It turns out in our work, most Americans don't know a lot about the National Academy of Sciences, and they would not trust their children. We actually did this to any advice of the uh, National Academy of Sciences advises scientists. Uh, it does not, and doctors, it does not advise street people about what's good for their kids. So what actually broke this? What broke it is the Queen's Pediatric Society put out saying pediatricians said it was safe, and then a pediatrician walked her child into the school with AIDS, and that was the end of it. Well, what a lesson I learn is. The lesson I learn is that people can have chip in their heads for years, and if you don't know in a crisis, they're not going to pay attention. They were not acting irrationally. That's what everybody said, acting irrationally. No, they're not. They thought their child could be coughed on and get AIDS. And so I have to know that's what they think, and then I have to have messages which say, guess what? AIDS doesn't spread this way. No, sorry, I know you think you did, but I know mom might have told you it doesn't spread that way. And so, and it has to be from credible sources. It's not enough to say the CDC or Academy of Sciences do this if the groups do not think uh, they're uh, credible. Uh, uh, here's the one we did on smallpox. So, can you imagine giving a seminar to Harvard School of Public Health and believing there had been recent cases of smallpox in the United States, you would be stamped on uh, by entering students, if nobody else. Uh, uh, for that, how could you imagine anybody could be so ignorant? Well, it turns out 30% uh, of Americans believe that there's a recent case at that time of smallpox. And uh, uh, two-thirds believed that there had been a recent case in the world. So why would I care about that? Why would I care about that? They're ignorant. Well, it turns out when Vice President Cheney wanted to give everybody a smallpox vaccine, guess in our survey who wanted it. If I thought it was here, it's not irrational to want it. Uh, if I know it doesn't exist anywhere, I didn't want it. So, but we all sat around and said to ourselves, what kind of a dope? would want this vaccine. God, it's not been around for years. What are they doing? Well, it turns out on the Topeka Turnpike, for those of you students know, I do all my interviewing on the Topeka Turnpike, uh, or in Indiana uh, today, but we have to leave that for another, uh, another purpose. So the, but what you see is that people have this chip. So in my technology, what do we do? We run focus groups, just like they do for Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, with groups around the country, and I ask them, what do you think this is due to? Do you think there's been a case? I listen to average people talk. And if they say, hey, I saw it on TV, you know, uh, uh, what program? Well, it was something about the Russians. Uh, <laughs> what, what decade was it? Uh, it was some late movie. And I told my mom, and she says, we got to get the shot. 
Uh, so I say, we better put this on a quick survey. Maybe people actually believe this. And that's what the messages are. But at the moment, messages are crafted by many agencies not knowing what people believe. It's what we believe, and we're going to tell you. The problem is that they have a chip. It actually makes it difficult for them to accept in their heads your finding unless you deal with their chip. You deal with their belief of something uh, that exists. And we're just going to do uh, a, a couple. The, uh, and this is where, again, I'm very uh, uh, uncomfortable. Let me just go back to this. Um, in the world I live in, people do not trust public authorities. And so that's where I have, it's very sensitive with people who are in leadership positions. Because as I'll show you in a moment, even for things like the CDC, a very large share of Americans do not believe what the CDC tells them. So one, you have two strategies when you get out there. And by the way, this is true now. We have a lot of work done in Europe uh, uh, and everything. It's called the American disease. If you're, in, if you're at Harvard, you're a respected scientist. If I'm in the state government, I'm a distrusted public official, uh, even though Howard runs over wearing the same Harvard tie. Uh, 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 people have a view uh, that these aren't done. So when you know that, and what is the uh, upswing, that is 9-11. So that's a quick lesson for you. When a crisis occurs, the public rallies around the leader for a few months. Uh, and then uh, the public starts going back to being very cynical uh, and distrustful. So uh, take a just quick uh, look at this. So uh, here, uh, this is uh, a standard for those of you who want to know where does he come up with these ideas. In uh, politics, what you do is you say, uh, we want somebody to endorse Senator Obama. Who is trusted by these people in North Carolina? So you run a list of names, and you go, hmm, they really trust this one, this community. And that's the person that makes the ads. So we had this original scientific breakthrough. Why don't we use the same scale and put Julie Gerberling's name in this thing and see how we do? And so uh, the good news is uh, the head of CDC does a lot better uh, at the time uh, uh, for this uh, than the head of Homeland Security uh, or the Secretary of Human Services who was doing all the briefings on, uh, in, in fact, in, in, in infections, everything. People just don't have, among political leaders, if we're talking about outbreaks of diseases, they do not have a lot of credibility. At the same time, uh, a senior CDC scientist isn't terrific. But what do I would have to say to the head of the CDC? In American politics, a 48% approval rating is not great, which means if you have a controversial statement, what you want is other groups to endorse simultaneously. So people ask me, I'm in a leadership position. What do I do? What you do is work behind the scenes. If we're talking about children's vaccines, Academy of Pediatrics, uh, AMA. So simultaneously, they have an emergency committee. And the CDC says, this is what we're recommending for children in this outbreak. The Academy of Pediatrics comes out the same day and says, this is what we're recommending. And the AMA comes out. So my distrustful person is here hearing simultaneous messages saying do the same thing. Rather than saying the CDC is the authority figure, that is in a country if you believe the CDC is the authority figure, but they're not the authority figure. Not that they are not here, they are not the people in my favorite turnpike. They're just not. There's a series of questioning about that. And so you start thinking about in a distrustful world, uh, what do I do? So let's take it down to the state level. Well, the first thing you discover is the most trusted group is not the state health department. Uh, and who is in this country? It's people's own physicians. So uh, one of the first things I do with these groups is ask the question, are physicians in your community wired up with an emergency email number? So if you had to tell them uh, what it was, what the heck SARS is and what to say, they would get a message from you. It turns out half the states have no connection at all. Uh, for this, including native community health centers and everything else. They have no emergency line at all. So the professor, they say to me, well, you know, money is tight. 
And I say to them, take the money you're spending on the public education campaigns that change nobody and put it in an email system where physicians will know what it is uh, 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 they have to do. Uh, uh, for this, for emergencies, because that's where people are going to flood. If the physician and whoever answers the phone says the same thing as the health commissioner, it's great. But if the physician says, I wouldn't take Cipro, I wouldn't do it, or uh, <laughs> Howard Coase says, don't go for Cipro, you don't need it. And the physician says, you've got to be crazy. I'm telling all my patients, go after the pharmacist, get it. Uh, for that, this is not a recipe for a successful crisis. So you want to get to them and explain, even if we're the high-risk groups or what it is, what you're going to do before it goes public, because that's where they're going to go. So the uh, uh, and it turns out, and this is no surprise, people have different people they trust. So in numbers, let's take minority or communities of immigrant communities, they do not trust standard establishment figures. And so uh, this is no great surprise. The school has 30 years of research showing this. But actually, we don't build leadership groups. Who would communicate? And so uh, people say to us, well, there's a crisis. I'm going to call up a group of African-American leaders in Boston and work with them. No, it isn't. In the middle of the crisis, they're not going to trust you. They're going to say, you're using me. That's exactly what you're on the damn phone to use me. If you don't work this out and say, we can have a crisis in Boston. It can affect communities you care about. How could we prove to you in this crisis? And they might say to you, well, I, I, I really trust Dr. Satcher. You have a, a phone that goes down to Dr. Satcher, and he calls back and says, this is sound advice. We're going to put it out. All right? Or they could say, so-and-so at the MGH, we really respect. He's been very important in our community. You get him on the phone. He says it's a good thing. So we've now worked it out. Uh, the crisis comes. We're going to call these two people. Based on that, you've agreed that you're going to take that advice. And when we talk to the African-American community about taking some vaccine or something like that, it's not going to be people that they don't trust uh, for that. None of this can happen unless you do this. Uh, ahead of time. None of it can happen right in the middle of the crisis. So we're going to uh, uh, quit in um, one second because people like to say to me, uh, well, uh, A, uh, even though they don't trust the government, uh, they trust health authorities when it comes to advice. So we actually ran around the world to figure out whether or not in the U.S. we have the same level of trust as Singapore. Why that's important is, and I actually had a just ball experience because uh, not knowing this in the, in the audience is something I just did, I usually say uh, Americans on a, a scale are the most individualistic about how they judge any advice. And Singapore, in the work we've done, are the most willing to basically accept uh, uh, the advice of authorities, regardless of what, whatever it is. And so we ha had this from a scale, and what they did in SARS was completely differently. And so, uh, people were asking the question, and this fellow leaps up and he said, stop, I'm the deputy police chief of Singapore, Blendon's right. Uh, you have a set of issues about individual behavior in the United States. We don't have a Singapore. People have a long history of Singapore of basically saying we've got to follow what the government says. And we're not worried a lot about civil liberties issues, which he said, so I will do that. So they use bracelets, they use police to quarantine people. But the important thing is you have to know your own culture. Uh, I can't imagine arriving at Logan, putting bracelets on people uh, 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 for that, with the Boston police telling you I'm here to help you with your health. Uh, I, I just can't imagine. Sorry, it's wrong country uh, for that. But I actually attended a, 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 an international meeting where we had the same issue with Homeland Security. Everybody said at WHO, we're all the same. Hold hands. I said, no, you have different cultures. Whatever you do in an emergency has to reflect the culture of the country you live in. Uh, you can't design, don't tell me what they did in Hong Kong or Singapore or something like that. Maybe Canada, but I, I have to know what would play here. I have to know that from, from people. And so I'm going to quit and take questions with just one, one piece of advice because the, uh, and again, I, I apologize that colleagues have different views. Uh, we have a lot of work that goes on if there is some emergency, how we would set priorities. Uh, we have uh, various analysts uh, to do this. We have ethicists to do this. And what worries me is we don't ask average citizens how they would respond to a set of priorities. Yet, if there was an outbreak, we would want them to comply. 
And I think in some of the ways that you would ration or make priorities, it would seem to average citizens is a very sensible thing to do. Other things which might make sense analytically and others will leave, I believe, the very substantial civil disobedience. It's not what people would think. It's not the way they would go about it. And you'll have a very tough time. So my general view is what we do in politics, while we're discussing how various scientists and editors see how to set priorities, why don't we interview average citizens? and ask them how they would respond. If the elderly get it first, or this group gets it first, or this group gets it first, or what if you hear this? So at least we report back in, when the crisis occurs, how are they gonna behave? Uh, and so uh, the assumption is the guideline will go out. But if we had one person leap on a plane with one you know, guideline, why do I not think there'd be 10,000 on some of the ways we think about how we're going to deal with these crises? So uh, this is sort of a, a, a new work. The closing, what, what do we have? We have somebody who actually took a technology from another field apply it to our field. One of the things very important is, is the emergency quick side of this. You try to draw some lessons about how people could respond the same way we would if we were dealing uh, with a political side. And it becomes another tool in how we deal with crises. And then I leave you with the fact that as an expert, crises are only one health issue you face. In government, it's an overwhelming issue if you fail at it. And so you have to pay attention to how well you do in these threats because your other agenda can be hugely affected. Questions? Uh, Dr. Can you just say a little bit about your research with um, Katrina? Because, you know, when you look at the media reports, it just seems like in every aspect, things just went bad. So could you just speak to that? Well, the, uh, 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 the people who stay, uh, stay uh, uh, in Katrina. So, I mean, th there are two issues about what happened. The response of the federal government was the worst in my life lifetime. So I've never uh, seen uh, the inability to mobilize and move resources in as, as poorly done. On the people side, you have a couple of things. The people who actually stayed uh, first turned out overwhelmingly had never been out of New Orleans in their whole, whole life. Two, uh, beyond being African American, they had other characteristics. They had no car, no credit card, and they were worried about how they would live out of town. Turns out the messages to people told you to evacuate and get to a bus. It didn't tell you what would happen to you. So they were very, very concerned about what would ha happen. I have no car, I have no money. W what am I gonna do? I've never been out of New Orleans. Where are they gonna drop me? How am I gonna live? None of these questions were answered. Also, 30% of the people who stayed had either they themselves or had a family member that was disabled. So this is the message. You gotta drag them to a bus which was only around regional centers. They didn't know how they were gonna get people out. I'm not gonna take grandma and drag her down the steps and what's gonna happen and where are we gonna go? So the messages for people who have certain types of issues were terrible. For general people who kinda of had been out of New Orleans, had money, had a credit card, it was easier. I got somewhere and I'd go out and I could stay somewhere else. But the people were there. And then the other side, which is just tough, is that uh, New Orleans had five warnings over 10 years of major storms. Four of them went there. And so the people who stayed were gamblers too. Uh, they just felt, damn it, they were wrong four times. This is a real threat to me a, a fifth time. So, but the rule is, which really bothered me is, every storm that's been studied, a share of people never leave. So the lives depend on your ability to get in quickly and not believe that everybody is going to evacuate. And so one of the assumptions of authorities and uh, of states that we've dealt with is we can get people out of Galveston and New Orleans, they'll all be gone. So it's not a problem of getting stuff into them. The problem is just getting them out. Uh, no study has shown you'll get everybody out. So the question is, how quickly can I get resources in? Uh, 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 to do that. Uh, but the people who stay are different than the people who leave. And if even you go to communicate, you have to be much more targeted. Howard? Every speaker we've had this year in this uh, incredible leadership speaker series has been nominated and suggested by you, the audience, uh, the students of the school. So as we prepare for next year, 
please give us our suggestions. Once again, I want to thank the committee. I want to thank Betty. And you can see once again why Bob London is in a league by himself. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bob, for your tremendous presentation.